Thank you. Um, good morning, everybody. And on behalf of DLF, just want to say a massive thank you for attending today. And said, my name is Melanie Poiser, and I'm the Partnership Manager for London and the South East of England. Um, so what's my role? Really, I'm a resource to you. Um, if you need any help, assistance in achieving the outcomes for your service users, that's my role, to assist you and support you with that. So the way we do that is through Trusted Assessor Training, which is a lot of you will know about which is our training for assessment for minor and major adaptations in the home. We're also going to be launching next month our Pro Assist um, which is for clinical prescribing so if you've already done the assessment <clears throat> you can um, use the tool to help you find the right solutions and the one that we're really excited about today is ArcSara which is our online assessment tool which is available to help you to find the best outcomes for your service users. So, a little bit about me, I spent 15 years working for local authorities, um, or a local authority in London, providing services for elderly and disabled people in housing. So, I can empathise with a lot of the challenges that you face. Um, probably not a pandemic, but other things. So, hopefully, I'm able to support you. So, today, can you see my screen? I'm hoping you can see my screen. Yeah, brilliant. Um, so today, brilliant, thank you. Today, I'm going to be talking about um, <clears throat> ArcSara, and I'll be talking about the history of DLF and what ArcSara is. I appreciate many of you don't know what ArcSara actually is at this moment in time. Um, just to reiterate, my name is Melanie Poiza, and my contact details are below. And if you're lucky enough to be in London or the Southeast, you've won the lottery. You get me to support you. So, just a little bit about ArcSara. So, ooh, technical hitch here. Right. Oh, the presentation's not moving. Ah, brilliant. So, ArcSara, um, basically, the DLF was founded in 1969, so that's 52 years ago. And it was founded by Lady Hamilton. And she had a real drive to campaign for the rights of people with disabilities so they could access equipment and daily living aid and also have um, access to the right information about solutions. It coincided with the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act, which was the first piece of legislation in the world for disabled people. So it really tied in with what we wanted to do. And as part of our early years, we had independent living centres where the public and professionals could attend and try equipment out for themselves or for service users. And three main aims for DLF was to act as a shop front for disability aids, to help disabled people lead a fuller life and to serve as a resource centre for professional workers. The centre boasted over 300 pieces of daily living aids and equipment and it was run by two OTs at the time. And people could come, they could try all the latest in the types of daily living aids that were available at the time. And they were sometimes very simple, like this piece of wood with two holes, but it doubled up as a extension for a hairbrush. And it revolutionized how people were able to live in their homes. Fast forward to now, we have a new shop front so we no longer have our independent living centres but we have Living Made Easy which is able for us to display our products, advice, information and support. So we have evolved with the times and we are as relevant today as we have always been if not even more so. Living Made Easy programme is specifically for the public and it really is more than just a new website, it simplifies what DLF is all about making living easier for everyone, people with disabilities and their carers. And the key part of that is ArcSara, our online assessment tool, which is able for people to, um, to go on straight on to find out what types of equipment would suit them best. And it can be brought to them by you as their local authority. So what is ArcSara? You pick over one of 90 topics. So it can be anything from dressing, bathing, communicating, eating, it could even extend to types of hobby and things you do in your free time. You're able then to ask some questions. So we ask specific questions that were um, put together by OT. So it's like having an OT assessment, but in your home um, remotely. 
And on the back of the answers that you provide, a bespoke report is generated that will direct you to the right types of equipment solutions for you that you as the service user can purchase. Um, it also will signpost you to other services and other types of um, areas that can support you and your needs. It boasts over 10,000 products, so they range from the latest in digital technology right through to some evolved old favourites. So we look at ArcSara as a golden thread that links people with disabilities to assistive technology, to the retail sector, to health and social care services, the volunteer and community workers and housing. And we also see that everyone on that bottom line can have a narrative and they can communicate with each other. Just like 50 years ago, there's another piece of legislation that is affecting change in how services are delivered, how information is provided, and how outcomes are produced. And it's there to empower, to provide better well-being physically and mentally. It's there to provide better independence in the home and for you to live better. So why ask Sarah? And we appreciate that there are massive challenges ahead for local authorities. As we know, we have the aging population, complex health conditions, people are living longer, and also that generates demand on services for you. Budget constraints have hit local authorities hugely over the past few years, certainly since I was in local authority, it's always been an issue year on year. And throw in a pandemic and you can see that the challenges ahead are massive. So one of the things that we found out is that people are willing to buy if they know what they need to buy. So it's really about re-educating people so that they understand that there are other ways that they can access care how they want it, but just through other channels. OT intervention is not always required for assessments, depending on what the need is. And sometimes having a first triage line of defence can easily put um, more attention for OTs where on more complex cases. People are not always one dimensional, so it's not about one size fits all. People's needs are different and in trying to achieve well-being, it support, it's important that we're able to meet their needs. And who better to know what they need than the service users themselves? They are living with or caring for somebody with a disability and often they know what's best for them. So why should you have a customised version? A customised version of um, ArcSara means that you have the power to integrate ArcSara within your own current online offering via your website. So every locality is different. Customization allows you to reflect the uniqueness of your residents and the needs of your community. Often carers can get very exacerbated in not being able to provide the type of environment that they would want to. By customizing ArcSara, you can create a clear focus taking into consideration the needs of carers. It's about asking the right questions. You want to be able to steer people towards the right pathways. So it's almost like dropping breadcrumbs so that people know that by following the right questions, they're going to be able to access the right um, solutions and will be signposted to those right solutions that are within your organisation and work in the locality. What happened next? Sometimes I speak to some local authorities and whilst they use ArcSara, they want to make sure that residents have found the solutions that they um, that they need. And you can easily do this with a baked in form within ArcSara or a link that redirects back to you if service users require further assistance. Capturing information is really important, reporting is important, and what we provide on a monthly basis is a report on how ArcSara has been used in your locality. You are able to let us know what types of things you want to know. So we will be able to tell you how many people have used it and what they're looking at, which is important because you will then know what needs are in your locality. Working in partnership, often you are linked in with a community equipment supplier and you're able to promote specific product categories if you so choose. You can let your um, residents know what is available via the community equipment um, services if you want to, and also within the wider other teams within the council. It is everyone's responsibility to look after residents, and if a housing officer or a social worker does a visit, 
they're also able to do an assessment using our mobile um, facility for Arksara, which can be used on a phone or tablet. So, so assessments can be done remotely within, with, and with the service user um, in situ as well. If you're a supplier of care products, it provides a brilliant USP for you. Um, it can create a better customer experience because your customers will be able to go directly to the products that they need. So hence, you reduce um, dissatisfaction instantly. You can tailor your topics that will lead directly to your product portfolio as well. And this applies as well if you're a dom care agency and you also want to have more of a holistic um, care package for your um, clients. So in the pipeline at the moment, we're looking, we're constantly looking at um, how we can improve. We've spent a lot of money trying to improve and invest in Arxara so that we provide you and your um, service users with a better experience. So we want to improve the usability of Arxara so that the diverse needs out there are comfortable using it. So whether you have a visual or hearing impairment, we're looking at better ways um, to, for accessibility. New advice and topics are constantly um, coming up and we're adding those to Arxara, which leads into the new streams that we're looking at in terms of questioning streams, specific areas and specific conditions. So learning disabilities, which I'm very excited about um, because I just feel there's a massive um, community and population that are not getting the help that they need. Um, and this is a brilliant way for them to be targeted um, to find assistance. Vision and hearing impairments, the same. And we're doing massive work on dementia um, as well. Sometimes we know that equipment won't solve everything. So we're looking at different ways of including social prescribing. And that links into interactivity. We want a more immersive um, experience for service users. So employing chat functions, whether it be videos, how to and how things are used into Arxara as well. And one of the key things that we're constantly doing is looking at new products and suppliers so that there's a bigger range of products out there so that it improves um, outcomes for your service users as well. So that's me. I've given you a whistle stop tour of 52 years of um, DLF. If you do have any questions, please do feel free to contact me. My contact details are below. Um, and I'm really hoping that you enjoy today's session. I think the key thing about today is you're hearing from your own peers about how Arksara is used in the real world. And if, as I said, if you have any questions, we have a Q&A session at the end, but also you can contact me individually. I am looking forward to working with a lot of you on your exciting product, um, projects that you've got um, in the pipeline at the moment. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. I'm delighted to be joining you all from Scotland. Um, I was just saying, I was delighted to see lots of faces this morning, which is nice. And I know there's probably people in the background I can't see. Um, um, I have worked in health, I've worked in housing and I've worked in social care. And now in the arrangements that we have in Scotland, I work in an integrated arrangement in health and social care, a fully integrated organisation there. I've worked in those different organisations for 30 years now, I'm horrified to say in, in some respects. Um, so I've got a lot of experience of those different settings. In my current post of being the Equip You Partnership Manager, um, for again a good number of years since 2004 and it's a strategic post. We have um, quite a unique setup in that we have um, seven different partners uh, for our, basically a community equipment partnership um, but it has actually expanded and developed and evolved very much over the years and we have additional partners who have joined us. So I'm going to go into my presentation um, now. You should be seeing this. Um, I mean, the context for us with this was that we, we felt this was a natural progression uh, for the EquipQ partnership to engage with um, Ask, um, Ask Sara um, and DLF to expand this. Can we move on to the next slide, please, Ben? Thank you. 
we have, and I mean, I think this was touched in when Melanie made her introduction, we, we have significant major challenges in health and social care in Scotland as much as any other part of the country. Um, and we have really been incredibly keen through a range of strategies and policy developing um, really to find much, much better ways of getting people to support people to self-manage and feel much more independent in the choices that they are making. I think um, you know we try and find the 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 benefits out of COVID and the year that we've had the, the year and a half that we've now had um, around um, this whole pandemic, but it really has kind of created even greater impetus around the need to um, find ways of of engaging with people more remotely, um, not bringing them into settings. How do we avoid that? How do we get to people and get a message to them? Um, in terms then, um, I mean, I've said a little bit about the Equip You partnership. We did, um, we have evolved as a community equipment um, service, but we have education, we have housing partners. Um, and as I said a minute ago, I think because of this wider agenda uh, for us in Scotland, we felt that working with DLF around this was this real opportunity to um, um, develop a tool that we can use upstream. I don't know if that's jargon that you're using um, down south, but it's this idea that it's that very much at that, that um, um, top of the of the prevention um, um, scale there, and and trying to avoid dragging and drawing people into services un unnecessarily. Next slide, Ben. Thanks. OK, so I mean, no surprise, and this was what Melanie said as well, that we want this to promote early minimum intervention. I mean, this is an approach that's been around for a long, long time. It's a, it's a central tenant of, of community care and was right from the beginning that anything that we should be doing in health and social care uh, should be around a minimum intervention to maximise people's independence. And unfortunately, the way we have structurally developed services has not delivered that at all. We have, you know, this idea that we do too much for people and don't give them enough choice and control. Uh, we just keep making the same mistakes over and over again. Um, so we, we are really hopeful that this can sit with these new strategies that are developing um, at the moment in our service areas um, to genuinely give people um, uh, this opportunity to make those choices um, without having to be, as I said, dragged into services. So our expectations are that the, this tool then acts as a platform that's going to give a range of information and advice. Um, and we would help that it would re reduce demand on current mainstream models, but not just to reduce that demand because it's genuinely making a difference in a, and giving people choices that they can go away and, and act on. So that, that's incredibly important. Um, next slide. Thanks, Ben. But that's just a screenshot of ours. So you, in Melanie's, you saw the version of this of the national um, 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 tool. So we've customised it with our, our colours um, up here, um, which are lovely shades of, of green. Um, and we kind of felt we've sort of simplified that, that, that screen in that setup. OK, thanks, Ben. Next screen. OK, so this maximising independence agenda is, is, a, is a very powerful at the moment and is really um, forcing our health and social care um, uh, colleagues to really reassess and, and look afresh at the way we do things and, and try and really not, you know, to stop us in our tracks in terms of sort of re repeating the same mistakes that we do when we create new service approaches. Um, so. We're recognising that we just can't keep doing these same things. We need to change this. Um, we need to give people that, that active role that's described there. And how do they properly share responsibility and ownership? And I think, I think for me in, in this, I mean, none of this ethos is new, as I said. And I'm, I'm sure that no matter what your policies and strategies in the different parts of the UK, you're all trying to do um, very much this, the same thing. Um, but I, I, you know, I think 
what we're all recognising here is that this is about behaviour and attitudes. Um, it's not just as simple as bringing a, a, a tool in. So how we this tool is great, but how we use this. Um, and it's about changing behaviours and attitudes in the public and what their expectations are, but it's also about changing behaviour and attitudes with staff as well, um, you know, and getting them to kind of unlearn the things that they would instinctively want to do for people and actually um, helping them to direct people to solutions um, and get them to, to reflect and think about the options that they may have. Um, next slide, thanks, Ben. Housing was something we really wanted to address um, in our customisation of the tool as well, um, because it would, I do work nationally as, as well with Scottish Government, and I've been involved in developing housing, uh, the housing solutions approach that we've been using up here. Um, and that is very much about um, encouraging um, our services again to act early with people, having conversations with people before crisis hits. Because again, because of the way structurally we've organised our services over the years and with criteria and all the things we put in place, it often means that we really are only dealing with people in crisis. Now, if we are using this tool properly, um, while it, it could have some use where people are in crisis, that's not really where we want to see our, uh, the use of this tool. We want to, to, to use it very much where people have time, as I said a minute ago, to reflect, to consider their options and choices. So although the, I think the Ask Sarah tool was fundamentally produced for to support people to self-assess and self-manage around equipment, we, we really see it uh, very much wider than that. Um, that we can signpost with some of the extra information that we've added in um, and will come out in the reports for people will be signposting them to reflect on their environment because the environment is actually fundamentally what determines um, how people can, you know how people can lead, lead their lives and I'm sure again for people out there who are working in services you'll know that we're often providing equipment and adaptations to people who are still fundamentally living in, in the wrong house. And that is the issue that we should have been sorting out in the first instance. So um, we want to very much use the tool in this context and, and so that it also supports staff in terms of these sort of early conversations um, and engagement with, with um, um, service users and the general public. Um, you'll notice that uh, we use a, a terminology in there called sowing the seeds. And I thought it was interesting, Melanie used the word breadcrumbs. So, uh, you know, when we use a product like this, it is about how we use that to, again, to get people to think and reflect and, and provide them with a choice of, of, of options and um, signpost them to a whole lot of different people they can talk to. I've also put in the bottom of that slide um, the reference to the adaptations without delay, um, because the College of Occupational Therapy, um, I, and I think one of your other speakers will be touching on this, has been incredibly keen as well to make it very clear that you know so much of what could be happening out there does not need an OT to be doing it. And again, that's a kind of a barrier that we've created in our systems and processes. And hopefully this tool is going to help support and avoid um, the, uh, that issue. Um, next slide, slide, Ben, please. Thank you. Okay, so how are we using it? Well, probably no different from many people out there. Um, we particularly, particularly think we'll be using it a lot for people at the at the point of a, a diagnosis of new condition and very much around ongoing self-management. So um, we're very much engaged. Our hospital-based staff um, see that as particularly important. Um, um, and they often feel that particularly families and carers, as well as the individual themselves, um, can often be overwhelmed at, the, at the, that stage. And actually, with some of the publicity materials that we've provided, um, this offers them something that maybe they can again go back and use when they've got more time and more headspace to start to do that. But it really could give them more control over their, that self-management approach. Um, we definitely think um, a number of our partners are very keen that it will um, target waiting lists, um, that 
it certainly complements a lot of the strategies around the use of, of technology and um, increasing people's knowledge of the simple um, types of technology out there um, and, and helping them understand you don't need to be involved with health and social care to get access to that. There's lots of simple things you can just be accessing yourself. I've talked about the links to maximising independence. Um, a number of our partners are very keen that they'll be involving the GPs um, and the GP practices. We have, um, I think it's similar down south, but we have um, uh, new, new workers in, in our GP practices, community link workers, who take very much a proactive role in picking up some of these wider um, needs of, of people coming through the, those services, and they are particularly keen to, to be using this. Um, and very much lastly on that slide is about our third sector and community partners and we've had such a positive response from them. Um, you know, they really don't need a lot of explanation as to how we think this can be used. They just say, oh yeah, it makes perfect sense and away they go and they know lots of people they can talk to about this and signpost them to. So I think it's my last slide now then, right? Implementing and launching it, we launched in December, so it's still very early days for us. We have produced a range of publicity materials. We're briefing DAF. Um, I'm speaking at a lot of the strategic forums particularly, so that we've got that strategic overview um, across all our care groups, um, so that this is not seen as an older people um, service at all. We've been very much engaging with children and family services as well as all our other um, care groups out there. Um, so we're doing lots at the moment to get it all launched and we will be evaluating. I think I'm on to my last slide now, Ben. Okay, so yes, it is just that. Um, I, just my contact details are on there if people are interested in knowing what we are doing specifically. Um, but hopefully that's given you a flavour of the approach and I think very much the ethos and the thinking behind uh, where we're coming from on this. Thank you. Well, thank you for inviting me to take part in this and I'm sorry to have joined you late. Uh, my name is Kate Bowman. I'm the Prevention and Information Lead for Adult Social Care at Newcastle City Council. We've actually had a suite of digital tools that we've been using over a number of years, and those include uh, the Newcastle City Council corporate website, which has a section on adult social care and includes a section on equipment and adaptations. Then most recently, we've got Your Equipment Newcastle, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. And then we have Information Now, and we have an equipment chatbot, which is on the Newcastle City Council corporate pages. So I suppose Information Now is our trusted brand. And what's important to us is to develop trusted brands for the public, but also for the volunteers and staff that are working across the city and they need to be able to go to digital resources. So our digital resources um, were developed, I suppose, a long time ago in 2010, and Information Now is the, the most trusted brand. So that is a resource that can be used by the public to find any information that they need, but it can also be used by staff and volunteers to try and find information for other people and to share it with them by email or by printing. So it's, it's a useful resource and it's information led. So you would be looking for information about health or care, leisure, lifestyle, money, benefits, that sort of thing. There are 14 categories. We found that a really successful tool and we have good Google Analytics showing that the people in the city are using it. So if you would go to the next slide, please, Ben. So in 2019, we also set up a prevention information and advice network in Newcastle. And that comprises the statutory services, so that's health and social care, and includes our provider services, such as the Mental Health Trust and Newcastle-upon-Tyne's NHS Trust. And it also includes the voluntary sector and the community sector. 
and they are vital to the work we do, sharing information across the city. So this network is really, I suppose, a formalization of things that have existed for some time across the city. During the coronavirus, it's been very important as a network. And we've moved to running that network through webinars uh, to make sure that we get in touch with everyone and keep people up to date. Next slide, please. So here you can see the branded version of ASSARA, which we have called Your Equipment Newcastle. And that's because we want it to be a brand for our city and we want to get that message across very clearly. So Your Equipment Newcastle joined our suite in 2019. But I think it's the rebrand which we launched in October 2020, which has got the best results for us. So what has happened is that it's an easier to do to use navigation tool um, and it's a web app. So it's easier to use on a mobile phone than it was before. Uh, so just like information now, we have to be sure that every technology will work with with it. So we, we need each device to work with this tool. It's done very well in the last two or three months, and we've had a good rising number of entrances and reports, mainly for people looking for help in the bathroom, the toilet area, uh, up and down the stairs. So they're looking at the mobility sections and how to access maybe in and out of doors, up steps within their home. If you live in terraced housing, there will be several steps around your property. So it's very important that people find a tool that can give them quick and easy information. And this has been working for us so far. Um, I think the thing that we've also done is make sure that people don't think they will be unsupported if they go to this tool. So once they get that, once they've answered their questions and they get their report, then they will get banners of information that takes them to uh, Social Care Direct, which is the access to adult social care for this city. They will get information about minor repairs from Care and Repair Newcastle, and also the Disabled Living Facilities Grant. So, and also actually uh, they get access to the wheelchair services in the city. So the important aspect of this tool is that people are still supported and they can find information. They know that they can get access to a needs assessment if they need it. But if they want to, they have the independence and the choice to buy products. So we're trying to do both things there. Also, our staff and our volunteers can take people through the tool as well. However, we would welcome that chat facility, I think, in the future. We are also looking at developing um, a software that we can use on this called uh, Recite Me so that people can access the tool even more easily if they have audio or visual impairments. Next slide, please, please Ben. So essentially, I don't think we think that digital is the answer to all our problems in communicating with people across the city. But we are really focused on making sure that people get right time, timely information, and that they get to be independent and make independent choices. But at the same time, they're backed up by Newcastle City Council. If you'd like to know more about what the prevention and information team do at, uh, in the adult social care team at Newcastle City Council, please email us at informationnow at newcastle.gov.uk. Thank you. I'm Louise Lapworth. I'm a Marketing Communications Officer at Warwickshire County Council, and I'm going to talk to you today about our experiences in Warwickshire of promoting the Ask Star website. So, um, we launched um, Ask Sarah in Warwickshire to the public in September 2019. Um, we did do a, a bit of a soft launch internally with um, staff 
and also with our members um, a couple of months before that. Um, we obviously felt it was very important um, to get our councillors in Warwickshire on board with it as well, because obviously having the links out to their own lo local communities, um, that they could promote it um, within, we felt it was incredibly important to um, tell them all about it before we went ahead with the public launch itself. So we ran our campaign from um, September to January. And at the bottom of the slide, you will see the branding that um, we used for that campaign. Um, and I have to say, we went through um, several iterations of design, both within our internal design team and also working with our internal um, project team um, and internal and external stakeholders before we um, got to this final um, brand that we decided to go with. Um, something we were very clear about was from the start was what we did not want it to look like. We did not want it to look like just another um, county council campaign. We wanted it to be lively and striking and something that would certainly get people to sit up and pay attention. Um, but something we were very um, clear about was the, the strap line of make life easier because we felt this was absolutely essential to what Ask Sara was all about. Um, it was about giving people access to smart ways to stay well. The website was incredibly simple and easy to use. And this was all about um, uh, letting people know about the gadgets and solutions that were out there to help them to stay safe, healthy and independent at home. If I can move to the next slide, please, Ben. So this very busy slide here gives you an overview of all the campaign activity that we undertook in Warwickshire. Um, and I must point out, of course, that our campaign was pre the pandemic. Um, and certainly there are things that we did then which we wouldn't be able to do in current conditions. But of course, moving forward, um, hopefully, who knows, the end of this year, going into next year, we'll, we'll be able to pick up and do some sort of face to face marketing activities with people again. So in the centre of the screen, you'll see um, some of the marketing collateral that we developed in terms of posters. Um, we made sure these were amply distributed around our own council office buildings, um, particularly in those offices where we had um, adult social care um, staff situated. Um, again, in sort of areas of high public football, footfall and areas where um, we knew that our councillors would see them also. Um, I talked a little bit about um, the, the partner launch event that we did, which you'll see at the bottom of the screen. And there's a photograph of all the members of our health and wellbeing board in uh, Warwickshire um, at the sort of launch event that we did with them. Again, where they were given an overview of what um, Ask Sarah was all about. Um, social media was incredibly important to us in terms of getting the message out, um, both or organic posts and some uh, paid for um, social media content as well um, across our Facebook and Twitter channels. And I'll talk about that in a little more detail in a moment. Um, we undertook a radio advertising campaign with um, Free Radio, which is one of our biggest um, commercial radio stations in Coventry and Warwickshire. We did a, a number of community pop-up events at um, two of our major hospitals in Warwickshire and also we utilised our network of libraries to go out and speak to people in their communities about Ask Sara as well. Um, we, we, we got good, some really good media coverage off the, the back of the events that we did. Um, we did some direct uh, mail outs to people within our communities that had already um, subscribed to receive uh, news from us. Um, and that was very effective as well. And um, later on in the campaign, um, uh, based on the, the fact that we, you know, we'd had really good response to that date, we invested in doing um, a pharmacy bag campaign as well, um, working with a company called Table Talk Media. Um, and that got the message uh, directly out into 37 um, pharmacies across Warwickshire as well. 
So, um, and I must say that all of the um, branding work was done um, in house and we didn't use any external agencies to develop the campaign. So I must give credit to my, my amazing colleagues, uh, Mike Jackson and, and Rhiannon Sims, who, who worked so hard on developing the campaign. If we can move to the next slide, please, Ben. So um, this is the, the radio campaign that we did with Free Radio. Um, we ran it for two weeks when we did the initial launch in September and based on the success of that we did another two week campaign in December as well. Um, and as I say, the, this is sort of a major local commercial station, um, their average um, listener age is 39. So this was very much about um, targeting carers as well as um, those sort of potential users of um, the, the products that Ask Sara would be recommending. Um, so we developed um, a couple of radio advert scripts with Free Radio um, using the, the voices of um, the, the potential end users speaking about their, you know, their own experiences. Um, and we tried to match those with the um, campaign material that we developed, the poster material um, and so on as well. So we had uh, one advert in the voice of a, 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 an older gentleman and one in the voice of a, a younger female as well. So if we can move to the next slide, Ben. Um, as I say, we did a, a number of pop-up community information events. Um, one at Warwick Hospital, one at George Elliott Hospital, which is in Nuneaton. So we covered the, the south and the north of the county. Um, we did one at um, Shire Hall, which is um, obviously our, our main council office based in the centre of Warwick and across our library network. Um, and the, these worked really well for us, um, basically myself and one of our occupational therapists that obviously had in-depth knowledge about the sort of um, products and, and gadgets that Ask Sara would give access uh, to and tell people about um, that they came out on the road. Um, we, you'll see in the, the top left hand corner there, the gentleman, that's um, actually our portfolio holder for um, adult social care and health, Councillor Les Caborn, um, and he came out as well, which was really great to have his um, support um, down at Warwick Hospital. And as well as being able to speak to patients, this gave us a really great opportunity to speak to staff um, within the hospitals in particular as well and make them uh, aware of it. Um, um, and the, the library events also proved to be um, really successful and we got a number of library staff on board to, to help us out with that. And again, you know, the great thing about being able to do events is that you can use those as opportunities uh, to promote um, with local news releases, again on social media, um, to get digital mail outs to those communities to tell people that you um, are going to be out in those locations and it just gives you another angle to um, promote the site. So we can move to the next slide, Ben. Um, at this time, we used um, a digital mail out service called Gov Delivery. We have since moved to using MailChimp, but at that time we used Gov Delivery. And um, as I said earlier, this enabled us to target our messages to individuals working in health and social care that had already described, but uh, subscribed to receive um, these sort of mail outs directly in their email inboxes and also to target um, individual communities across our boroughs and districts in Warwickshire. Can go to the next slide. Um, so yeah, the Yellow Pharmacy Bag campaign was a four week campaign that we launched in December. We, we thought the timing of um, this was particularly key. Um, I think, you know, unfortunately, as we've seen in recent months, um, this is a time of the year where um, illness picks up. You find a lot more people going into pharmacies and it's um, sometimes carers that are going in to pick up prescriptions on behalf of people as well. So um, we felt this would be a, a really good way to get the message um, in front of people. Um, 37,000 pharmacy bags were printed up with our Ask Sara campaign branding. Um, so that was a thousand for each of the pharmacies. Um, it also gave us an opportunity to get the message out to pharmacists. And the um, 
pharmacy bags were backed up with um, a poster campaign as well. So um, poster materials were sent out to those pharmacies, along with a covering letter explaining what the campaign was all about. Um, and again, this was supported by additional in-house communications. Um, and of course, using paper bags, we felt was a lot more um, environmentally friendly than um, other sort of options. Um, you know, branded pens, that sort of thing, um, we decided this was um, a much better option for us. So if we can move to the next slide. Um, again, this is about the social media reach that we achieved, which was a mix of um, paid for and organic. Um, and we were very um, pleased with um, the, the reach that we managed to get and the amount of engagement that we got through Facebook. You can go to the next slide. Um, uh, and again, that's an example of one of the um, posts that we sent out. If we go to the next slide, please. Um, we also used Twitter. Um, I think the great thing about Twitter was the amount of sharing that we saw, particularly um, by partners that we were working with. So um, South Warwickshire um, NHS Trust. Um, it was the same with um, George Elliott um, Trust in Nuneaton. Um, the CCGs and our borough and district council colleagues were all great in sharing those posts for us. Um, we also tried to do um, uh, something a bit interesting with the sort of post that we did put out there. So on the right hand side there, you'll see um, a little video that we put out of one of the um, animatronic cats that we took out to events with us that got a lot of attention. Um, and uh, so we, we managed to get a good few um, views of the, the videos that we put out of the, of the cat. Next slide, please. Um, yeah, and that's uh, just some more examples for you of the sort of sharing that we saw um, on Twitter by um, partners. So we can go to the next slide. Um, so this is um, a, a marketing funnel diagram, which sort of shows you in terms of the reach, um, particularly on social media that we got with the campaign, how that actually translated into engagement and how that then went on to translate into um, the amount of people visiting the website, which of course was absolutely key to us. So we can go to the next slide. So that's an overview of the sort of campaign that we activity that we did. And you can see that um, most of that was around September and October. Um, we did do some newspaper advertising as well, which we felt was really important to get the message out to people that were perhaps um, not online, um, which is, you know, absolutely key to get out to those groups as well, um, as well as doing all the sort of digital work that we did as well. Um, the pop up community events sort of took place across October, November, and then, as I say, going into December, January, we did the um, pharmacy bags campaign. So if we can move to the next slide. So the great thing about working with DLF is um, the quality of the data that you get back in terms of who's visiting your website. Um, and that has been, has been absolutely key to us in terms of campaign planning. Um, so as this shows, as you would have expected, um, most of the website entrances were at the start of the campaign, um, which obviously proved to us the value of us running the campaign and the different methods that we were using to market it and to get it out there. Um, if we can move to the next slide. Um, we were obviously use, able to use the Google Analytics data provided by DLF to show us where people were coming to the site from. Um, it was really interesting to see that most people were coming directly to the site, which meant that they were perhaps going into their browsers, directly entering um, the website address. Um, so that proved to us the power of um, sort of the, the marketing collateral we're putting out in terms of posters and that kind of thing, um, the pharmacy bags, which actually had the website address on them. Um, Gov delivery also um, proved to be um, great for us in terms of getting uh, people to the site. Again, you can see Facebook proved really, really effective, much more effective than, than Twitter. So that was really interesting. Um, you know, a, a lot of people were, were actually Googling it. So obviously they, they'd seen the publicity and were actually Googling Ask, Ask Sarah Warkshire, which was great. Um, and the SharePoint statistics show that um, our own staff were responding to the internal communication that we'd uh, done about it as well. And we're visiting the website off the back of that. So if we can move to the next slide. 
Um, and again, you can sort of go down into all sorts of detail um, using the, the analytics that DLF provide. Um, and this sort of shows you again over the course of the campaign how we moved from initially people coming directly to the website and through things like Facebook to later on in the campaign, it was more um, sort of staff responding to the internal communications that we'd done about it. So if we can go to the next slide. So um, th this was sort of pre the current version of the Ask Tara website that's being used, which of course is um, sort of um, more mobile friendly now. So we found that the majority of people were um, uh, using their, a desktop device, you know, a laptop or desktop computer to access the website rather than um, mobile or tablet. Um, but we think that would very much be um, different now if we were to look at the analytics again running a similar campaign. So if we can move to the next slide. So um, that shows the number of uh, total site entrances that we had over the course of the campaign. Um, the, the brilliant statistic for us was that 74.5% of these visitors were new visitors. Um, so they weren't the same old people that had come to the site once and they were coming back uh, again and again. That um, also proved to us that it wasn't just our own staff that were visiting the website and using it as a tool that actually this were, was sort of a members of the public um, using the site. And the other um, brilliant statistic for us was um, in terms of the number of reports that were completed by people coming to the website. Um, because, you know, again, that was absolutely key. We didn't want people just to come um, have a quick look and then go away. We wanted people then to engage with the website and then to go on and to complete that um, self-assessment report, um, you know, either for themselves or for someone that they cared for. So if we can go on to the next slide. So uh, our conversion rate in terms of site entrances to completed reports was uh, 0.46, so which basically tells you that for every site entrance, just under half of the visitors that visited the Warwickshire website completed a report, which we were really, really delighted with. So if we can move on to the next slide. So um, other speakers will have talked about um, the, the sort of the revamp of the website. This is how our Warwickshire website is looking now. Um, it's got a refreshed look. Um, it is easier to navigate. Um, it is more mobile friendly. Um, and um, yeah, we, we are on the verge of doing our own public relaunch of that. In fact, we put out our first um, sort of communications about that yesterday. And if we can move on to the final slide, you'll see hot off the press, we have updated some of our marketing materials to reflect what the website is looking like now. And um, this is what we will be pushing out um, over the next few weeks and months. So I hope that gives you an overview of the sort of activity that we undertook in Warwickshire, um, working with DLF. As I say, we were really delighted with um, how the campaign went. Um, and, you know, thank you to DLF for all their support um, with that. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. So I was uh, inviting Janet, uh, who's the programme manager for the DLF, to, uh, to, to make a few comments and tell us a little bit more about um, uh, <clears throat> what's happening at headquarters. So Janet, over to you. OK. Thanks, Charles. Thanks, Charles. Um, I'm just going to make a few um, observations, general observations, about um, Alfara. Um, I've been lucky enough to work across a, a range of projects across the UK that have involved ASARA. Um, and I guess what I would start by saying is that for us, uh, it's very much uh, something like the Trusted Assessor Framework that uh, looks to work within local service delivery. Um, it only works well when it works um, as an integrated part of service delivery in those localities. So what does that mean for us? It means that we need it always to be flexible um, in the way it can be delivered, um, impartial. I think um, it goes without saying that the impartiality of the tool is one of its uh, 
most important platform. Uh, you know, anyone that gets involved with it can rely on the fact that it's directing people using broadly a clinical basis to, to work towards recommended solutions. Um, and the other thing is that it's important for us, there's pressure on us as, as the charity to represent um, the broader assistive technology market um, as it is, so that uh, members of the public can view and, and find out about as far as possible, all the solutions that are out there and available to them in, in the market. Um, an example, I guess, I would um, draw would be that during the COVID pandemic, we know that people have been able to use the tool to identify simple aids, which can often then be um, ordered and delivered to them at home. So under the restrictions of the pandemic, it's, it's been part of the solution to enabling independence for older and disabled people who haven't been able uh, to get out and about, and yet their needs may have changed uh, within that time scale. Um, it is a, a sort of risk-based tool, and, and again, it's important that as we go forward, we um, invest in adding additional topics and so on, and that we maintain that approach of uh, you know, directing people uh, towards things that can help them. Uh, but, but associated with that, again, service providers, service providers who are providing care and housing and health and social care services um, need to be able to uh, rely on the fact that it will direct people back to them when it should so that uh, it helps as far as possible with simple aids and so on. But if someone has complex needs, it's vital that they are linked back into the statutory pathways that exist in their particular locality. So that's an important component. Um, I'm disappointed that Chris Humphreys wasn't able to join us. Um, I worked with Chris's team in Newport uh, City Council a couple of years ago when we were looking to introduce uh, this is part of a program, um, part of a prevention agenda that Chris's team were working on. Uh, we went through um, extensively looking at the, uh, uh, the legislation, the policy in Wales, and in particular um, how it fit with the Social Services and Wellbeing Act for 2014. And I think I would just draw attention to that because what it underlined for us at the time was the importance of information as a prevention strategy and I think that's that's the head that, that's run through all of the pr uh, presentations today. Um, I was delighted that once uh, the Newport um, program had you know had launched and had worked well that um, the, the greater region uh, Gwent picked up on it and then rolled it out to the whole of the Gwent region meaning that it was then available more than a quarter of the population in Wales. But I think, again, that, that, that sort of underlines the importance of uh, ensuring that it fits within policy and service delivery within, you know, within the locality. So I think those are really my main points. I, I thought there was um, some excellent uh, detail in people's presentations today. Uh, it's a shame that we weren't able to, um, to meet with um, Rachel Russell, who I think wanted to talk about ARCOT's Adaptations Without Delay uh, paper and how that related and so on, and also, you know, the Welsh experience. Perhaps we'll, we'll find a way to, to get that uh, material aired uh, in a different channel, perhaps. But, um, yeah, I think there's been some fascinating detail provided by the speakers this morning, and um, it would be great if we could uh, perhaps open up uh, to the panel and uh, answer any questions from people who've been uh, watching the presentation. Um, uh, starting from the top of ones that haven't been answered yet, um, Lindsay Munro asked how much the, the license is and is it an annual fee? Janet, would you like to to uh, to answer that one, or um, should should I should go for someone else? 
so either myself or Melanie can answer, I'll, I'll jump in. So um, licensing is based on, yes, an annual fee and also um, a one-off charge to, to create the version and integrate it with, you know, with, with the information in that particular locality. Um, I think as, as a lot of the speakers alluded, we, we take it and we add a lot of, of local information and signposting and so on. So that typically takes um, about uh, 10 to 12 weeks. Um, so from start to, to having something that can then be launched in that, uh, in that area of the country. Uh, but yes, after that, there's, there's an annual charge um, which enables uh, licensees to keep it up to date and fresh and send through any changes they want to make to their particular version that we then implement for them. Uh, the, the next question, which I think has been answered, but it, I, I, I guess for completeness, um, if one of you can just uh, answer it formally, um, from Stephen Leitner. Uh, says, uh, I have a new role with NHS England for people with learning disability. Does Ask Sarah cover that audience? Um, hello, um, it's Melanie. Um, it covers, the thing with Ask Sarah and what we do is we look at need. Um, so one of the things is, although somebody may have a specific condition, um, we would look at the need. So for example, somebody with a learning disability, whilst they may have cognitive difficulty so they may need um, assistance with reading or with um, household kind of instruction for example there would be things specifically to help them with to help them cognitively to do things conversely they may have trouble um, getting dressed so it may not have anything to do with their learning difficulty specifically but it's a need so they may have problems um, getting dressed and Arksara would direct them to um, a product which would help them as well as it would help somebody who might have a different physical disability, for example. So it's about the need and what that person would want, what their outcome would be. So, yes, we help people specifically with learning disabilities to help them function because of their learning disability, as, as well as helping them to do everyday things that anybody with any kind of disability or without a disability might have trouble doing. So it works in both ways. Um, I'd encourage them to, to have a think about what the outcomes are they're trying to achieve for people with learning disabilities. And certainly, if you want to email me directly, we can have a further conversation. You might have a little bit more you want to expand upon that, that question. I'm quite happy to have that dialogue with you afterwards. I hope that Thank answers you. Thank you very much, Melanie. That, that's most helpful. Uh, next question uh, is directed to Alison. Uh, as a local OT, um, I wonder what your uh, conversion rate is so far. I realise it's very early in the process for you, so may not yet be determined. Alison, you got... Uh, Thanks for that. It's Sorry? I can hear you Sorry, now. Charles, can you hear me okay? Yeah? Yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, yes, I, I mean, it's, it's very early for us. We've, we've really only had um, uh, two, two reports through so far. And actually, um, a bit like um, Louise was describing, or I think it might have been Kate, um, you know, our launch has been very much within the staff groups um, initially, and that means that actually, um, you know, a lot of the people who are going on to the site at the moment are, are, the, are the staff and becoming familiar with it, and so that they understand better what it, what it offers. So it's probably a bit too early for us to, to, um, um, to, to have any information, meaningful information on that at the moment. Um, but I thought it was interesting listening to Louise. I'm, I'm very hopeful that if, if we're taking some of those approaches on board, that, that we'll, we'll be trying to maximise that, obviously, as much as possible. OK, thanks very much, Kirsty Nicholson, for that question. Ne next question from Cheryl Hill. Uh, I'm still not clear if following our SARA report, which links to the purchase of products, are these then purchased by the inquirer or pro I can't, can't read it properly or processed as an order through the equipment service? 
So I, I think you're saying, Alison, by nodding your head like that, that, that they are not processed through the equipment service. Is that correct? Yeah, yes, they're, they're, they're not through the, the equipment service at all. I, I mean, I don't know whether people have different different parts of the country but the whole point is is signposting people directly to a wide wide range of, of, of alternative suppliers people who can um so that they can purchase directly from them yes it might um, be helpful uh, for me to sorry kate sorry. you want sorry, to say Tom. something kate uh, yes thank you i was just going to say i think for us one of the reasons for having a tail tailored product uh, for Newcastle is that we're not responsible for maintaining uh, the product list. So that's the bit that DLF and Living Made Easy do for us. So they are checking and verifying products. Now that doesn't, so the user still has a choice whether or not to make that purchase or whether to get further advice from wherever, including from the councils. But for us, that is one of the good aspects of it because it's a vast choice and it's been checked through. Good point, yeah. Uh, uh, Cheryl also asks, please could you give an example of the cost of the license and the one-off fee? I, I, I have a horrible feeling that's probably asking for how long a piece of string is um, because it will probably vary, vary by by the number of uh, of uh, people that the that the system is aimed at, but uh, can anyone answer that or give a comment or something like that? Janet, do you? Uh... I can answer that, Charles. Yes, it's probably more standardised than you might imagine, and in fact, um, the Asara licensing structure. Uh, you can actually see it on something called G Cloud 12, which is the um, oh, yes. the, uh, okay. procurement framework. Um, so the, the specific answer to the question is that um, typically a project would cost around eight to ten thousand pounds to create a version and then uh, something around eight to ten thousand pounds per annum uh, depending on the complexity but, but broadly those will be the sorts of levels. Um, there is also related to the previous question, um, we do have some versions which are integrated with the local community equipment um, contract. And what happens with those is that when the user views the products, they see the ones which are on that contract and then they then see the rest of our um, database as well. So it's just a way of um, really alerting the public to uh, the potential availability of some of those products but that that's the uh, you know that obviously depends on the strategy of the service provider in that area but it's certainly something that we we can do um okay the, i think kate mentioned about our keeping um, you know the database up to date sort of thing we have over 10,000 products live today on that system. The products, the scope of them is broadly in line with the World Health Organization's definition of assistive technology. So everything from small aids through to major adaptations and so on. Um, and okay. we have over 900 retailers who connect to those products. So for any particular product, there might be several retailers who can um, provide it and we provide their pricing and links to them and so on so that the user can choose from uh, right. you know a, a bunch of retailers and go to the one they prefer um thank you charles really interesting and um uh, uh great to learn the 52 year history of the uh, uh the dlf uh, whose mission um you know seems um pretty enduring doesn't it to help people with disabilities to maximize their lifestyles and uh you know as per the website uh make life easier uh gosh you know uh, that is no more uh, no less relevant today than 52 years ago i'm sure um 
offers a great opportunity for early intervention uh, to help people to maintain their independence. Um, but, but I've heard really about the challenges uh, of um, seizing that opportunity uh, and um, the support needed uh, when, uh, as Melanie said, you know, people are willing to buy uh, if only they could, um, could, could work out what's out there and what is most appropriate to, uh, to their needs. So um, I think all of the presentations have uh, followed a, a similar response to, uh, uh, to that challenge. Uh, and we've heard lots of examples about um, uh, how to transmit knowledge, how to and how to raise awareness. Um, these days, not through DLF physical shop windows uh, uh, on the high street, uh, but uh, uh, over the website, um, uh, you know, giving the same, um, uh, trying to address the, the same uh, uh, aim of uh, raising awareness of what's out there and uh, and sharing knowledge and the simple three-step Ask Sara tool uh, when embedded in a trusted local authority website um, offering an impartial service uh, with a directory of verified products. Um, uh, it, it is great to hear the feedback of how how well received uh, uh, that, that service uh, uh, is being. But the other thing that I took from the conversation was how um, uh, raising awareness is not the only obstacle to be overcome uh, for people who are keen to make a purchase and maintain their, their uh, independence because um, it, it, it's not an easy purchase. Uh, so, and it's not, um, uh, you know, it, it's not a, a, a one-off um, uh, sort of click on the website, make a decision and uh, place an order. So I was really interested and I've sort of, you and I, Charles, have heard that before from Carers UK, uh, uh, for instance. So it was really interesting to hear about the product development uh, around the chat facility uh, and it was really interesting to hear about um, uh, the, the support offered through sort of uh, further signposting and access to staff and volunteers to help um, uh, citizens make their decisions, uh, uh, families, carers, uh, uh, people with disabilities. Uh, make their decision. So I was really struck by one of the points that came in uh, towards the end from uh, from Janet about um, Ask Sara working best when it's uh, uh, integral or integrated into the service uh, 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 offered uh, and uh, and is not a bolt on. And once again, Charles, you know that's a familiar story for you and I with. Uh, technology in health yeah. pathways, care pathways, or whatever. So I guess I, I'd just like to repeat um, those three points that um, what a great tool this seems to be in uh, raising awareness, um, how the, the purchase requires, you know, a building of understanding once that uh, awareness has been raised uh, that will lead to you know the, the commitment to action and the decision to uh, to purchase uh, and to support that journey from simply raising awareness to completing a purchase uh, needs a bit of support uh, uh, so uh, needs uh, the involvement of staff uh, and or volunteers and or the chat facility uh, uh, within Ask Sara because that's what makes it integral or it integrated. Uh, and that's what results in, um, you know, knowledge just being tra trans transferred and nothing happening, but knowledge being transferred and it leading to something that helps people to uh, uh, maintain their independence uh, 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 for longer. So um, I find it um, 
very interesting conversation. Thank you.